Welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. For the next hour, your hosts will go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam, the provocateur. And Cam, we are joined by potentially the most notable person in the spy podcasting world, I think. Yes, one who's going to put us to shame, I think. Yeah, I, I definitely can see it coming. Um, we are joined by Shane Whaley, the host of the Spybrary podcast and also the owner of Spybrary.com, which is basically where I go for a lot of research. And he has loads of articles about books and spy books, I should say, and spy movies. So, Shane, welcome aboard. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, Scott and Cam. I've been enjoying your, your podcast. And in fact, you'd be pleased to know that I recently... Uh, re- released a, a published a list of my top 10 favorite spy co- podcasts and you guys are on it oh. you made my mock list we, we were made. honored to see that yeah uh, that was incredible so maybe just tell the audience a little bit about the spyberry and how it got started absolutely well i'd read a series of books funny enough written by len dayton they, they weren't the harry palmer books it was about another guy called bernard sampson and it's one of those things where I'd read the whole, the 10 books in the series. And I was like, I really need to talk to someone about this book and what's happened. And my friends are into beer, football, and women. They're not into spy lit. Uh, family definitely aren't. So I thought, hey, why not start a podcast and chat to other people around the world and get a conversation going? And that was way back in 2017. And uh, since then, we're, we're gunning for a quarter of a million downloads of the show and I always, Bill, it's, it's, I really appreciate the introduction that you've given me, but quite honestly, I just see myself as a curator. I don't really see myself as the spy authority. And if you join our Facebook group, I know you're on, Scott, there are some scholars, spy scholars on that page who really do know their stuff. So my goal is to bring those people on the show and discuss books, spy books, spy movies, spy TV, et cetera. And uh, I bill us as by spy fans for spy fans. And the UK's Radio Times recently reviewed us and called us espionage as entertainment, which I was very flattered about. Oh, that's incredible. I remember when we did our Ipcris file episode and I think Scott posted a link there and there were some comments on the Ipcris file that I think gave Scott and I some dark nights of the soul, really pondering whether we knew what we were talking about because they were so insightful and just fascinating. Talking about things even relating to American versus British shopping customs that we were just like, wow, totally over our heads. It was incredible. Well, I know Scott's in hiding because of his comments and observations on the Ipcris file. In fact, I think someone in our group have issued a fatwa against Scott for him not liking the Ipcris file. So uh, I hope you're enjoying life in hiding, Scott. Well, like, I've been training for it all year with uh, being in lockdown. This is perfect for me now. Ah, that's right. Maybe that's why you were so brave to diss the movie. You knew people couldn't get to you. Yeah. He picked the perfect time, the perfect time in human history to do it. But that's the beauty of what we all do, though. And uh, we're going to have that in this movie as well. This movie in particular we're going to talk about, um, it. it there are people in our group who love it and others who hate it. It's a real Marmite job. Totally, yeah. And I'm just curious, what was your background with the Harry Palmer films or the novels by extension? I'd, I'd, I'd watched the films in the past, enjoyed the films. I hadn't read the books at that stage. So it was only when I started Spy I mean, I th- it was funny when I started the podcast, and I know you're going to have this with spy movies. You think, yeah, you know, I've watched a fair few and then you start a podcast like this and you get all these suggestions. I think, you know what? I don't, I, I only know like 10% of this. So I've been able to, in, to read so many more books and, and watch more spy movies than I ever knew existed since I started the podcast. Right. Yeah. That, that's definitely something that resonates with me versus Cam, I would say. I, I always uh, put Cam on a pedestal as the man who knows cinema. And even he gets flummoxed by some people's suggestions. So imagine how I feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And and that's the, the, the real cool thing about online communities and podcasts is we're able to go on this journey of discovery. And also, this is not politics which, or football, which is so tribal. You know, you can have different opinions, as you guys have done on your show, and particularly with the Ipcris file, and we see in the Spyberry community as well. There's no right or wrong, other than Roger Moore is the best James Bond, but we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> so is he your James Bond? Yeah, he's everyone's James Bond. Come on. Well, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think I think your uh, readers and listeners will probably come after me even more if I say who my favorite Bond is. So let's just move on uh, to <laughs> David Niven, folks. David Niven. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Um, well, that leads us beautifully into what we're tackling today. So, Cam, what is the movie of the week? We are tying off the Harry Palmer theatrical trilogy with the 1967 film Billion Dollar Brain, directed by Ken Russell. Now, before we delve into uh, what we know of the film and the background, let me just get out that uh, letterbox.com synopsis. Any any votes on how long it is? I feel like if it uh, tries to explain this movie, it's about an hour long to read. <laughs> Yeah, get ready for uh, it may surprise you to be fair. Uh, here oh, nice. we go. Billion dollar brain, pow, power, brain power. A former British spy stumbles into a plot to overthrow communism with the help of a supercomputer. But who is working for whom? Wow, that's so concise. That's a uh, that's an A on the cam scale of grading um, letterboxed synopses. That's that's effective and to the point. I I literally can't fault that. Yeah, and I really want to. I can fault other things, but not the synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll just say to clear, I hadn't seen or heard of this film before we started this podcast, so I have no previous experience with it. Uh, Shane, you said you had seen it before we spoke before we started recording. So what were your initial thoughts before you went to revisit this film? So I love Harry Palmer as a character. And in fact, I'm a huge fan. I think one of my favorite spy movies is Funeral in Berlin. In my in my spy brewery here at home, I have an eight foot poster, original cinema poster uh, for Funeral in Berlin. Huge fan. So you can then imagine that I get onto Billion Dollar Brain expecting it expecting it to be like a return of the jedi moment in the star wars truth thing at you we go this is going to be great and sorely disappointed right and i've watched it a couple of times since then because as i said earlier on so many members of our spybury community whose views i appreciate and value and respect are huge fans of the movie and i ask myself but we'll dig into this later on, i'm sure but what am i missing here and I think in some ways, there's also another big discussion on Spybury. You know, a lot of the books that are bestsellers in the United States are these action hero, Rambo, Special Forces, America, kicks ass style of books, as opposed to the UK, where John le Carre or Len Dayton himself, the more what I call erudite, intelligent spy writing, will be the bestsellers. And I always say that back in my 20s, so I, I'm mid-40s now, but back in my 20s, I'd have loved the action hero books. I wouldn't have liked John le Carre. And the same with my movies. Now when I watch a spy movie, I want that gritty realism. And I feel that Billion Dollar Brain really moved moved so far away from the original two movies in this trilogy. Yeah, that's really interesting what you say there about, you know, action, ver like sort of the action stories versus the spy stories. I kind of feel the same way where, you know, when I was a kid, I was uh, I texted Scott the other day, my top 10 or no, sorry, my top uh, Bond rankings for the for the movies that I wrote when I was like 13 and all the ones that are near the top are the ones that involve shark scenes and right. it's like nowadays if I write that list I'm looking a lot closer at Honor Majesty's Secret Service or you know the Casino Royale with Daniel Craig the ones that take it a little more seriously and yeah the Ipcris file for me watching that movie was a real revelation because it was a spy story I never knew I wanted I would I would agree with that. And I think at different ages, we like different things or, or different moods. I mean, I still enjoy the old Euro spy movies. I love a Bond movie because I know what I'm getting. I think with Billion Dollar Brain, it was such a departure from the first two that I that I was in shock. I thought, to be honest with you, I think that the Billion Dollar Brain is, as we say in football or soccer back home, a game of two halves where you had the Finland and, and uh, Latvia scenes. And then when it moved to the States, when it moved to Texas, it was so jarring for me. And it went from that gritty kind of spy movie to a bombastic Bond movie in many ways. And I just found it too jarring. Mm -hmm. What I found a little bit interesting about what you said there, Shane, is that you found Funeral in Berlin to be your the, the perfect balance. It's like the Goldilocks effect almost. Because I found Ipcris File personally to be far too... Uh, realistic and gritty mm -hmm. and I liked Funeral in Berlin more because it had a little bit more of that Bond feel to it but it sounds like you wouldn't say that about it 
Yeah, no, I, I think it did, but it wasn't bombastic Bond. Mm. You, know, you talked about the, the fight scene outside, was it the Albert Hall in Chris File? <laughs> <laughs> and how much you loved that, Scott. And how much I'm looking forward to the YouTube video of you creating that with Cam post COVID. It's happening. It will happen. It will happen. I, uh, any excuse to push him down the stairs. <laughs> exactly. And there, there is obviously a bit more action fuel in Berlin, but I just think, I'm, first of all, I'm a huge fan of Berlin as a city. I'm a huge fan of Cold War history. Uh, I have another podcast, which is all about the history of East Germany. So that has a lot in its favor. But there are so many iconic landmarks and sites. I've often gone to Berlin and had, had a scotch and looked at the Mercedes-Benz building and taken myself back to the funeral in Berlin era. Um, so the, the movie does have a lot of emotional attachment for me. And I guess I'm glad you didn't invite me on to, to do that show with you because I, I think I would have been, uh, yeah, that emotional attachment to it might have got in the way. <laughs> no, I totally understand. I think we all have those movies too that just speak to us in a way that maybe other people just don't get. Yeah, Spy Kids 3. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, Cam, what do we have about this film and how it was put together? Because it didn't see, it didn't so it didn't sound like Funeral in Berlin did particularly well when it came out. No, Funeral in Berlin was sort of one of those modest performers that did okay enough to justify a sequel, I guess. But it wasn't like a. I suspect if you're, you know, Harry Seltzman, the producer, and you're looking at the grosses of your James Bond series versus your Harry Palmer films, you're a little disappointed. But they decided to press on. And Billion Dollar Brain was a like a book that came out after they'd optioned the initial rights for Harry Palmer. And it got a lot of good response. And so Harry uh, Seltzman said, OK, let's do this one next. They skipped right over Horse Underwater, which was the second novel. I'm just curious, sorry, um, Shane, if you have you read Horse Underwater? Yes, I have. Um, I could also say there's a huge amount of disappointment within our Spybury community why that wasn't filmed. So it does seem like something that would have made a good movie, you're saying? Yes, definitely. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so the rights um, for Billion Dollar Brain were up in the air, and Harry Seltzman went to Len Dayton to buy them, and Len Dayton demanded $250,000. And so they paid the rights. And um, the, cho the choice of director is interesting because Ken Russell, um, I think for those of us who know him now, we know him for his cult movies, doing things like The Devils, Altered States, which is probably my favorite of his. And he also did the Who movie, um, Tommy. So he was kind of a bizarre dude. But back in these days, he was more known for television and documentaries. He had done a 1964 film called French Dressing, which was like a huge flop. But he was looking at getting back into films. And he had a talk with Harry Saltzman. And Harry Saltzman said, you know, what are you interested in doing? And at this point, this is where the stories kind of get a little mu uh, muddy because Ken Russell has given two different accounts. One was that he wanted to make a movie about Nijinsky, who was a Russian um, ballet da uh, dancer who had schizophrenia. So it was kind of a very tragic life story. But then he also says he said he wanted to do a movie on Tchaikovsky, the Russian composer. So um, I feel like um, Ken Russell's not the best at keeping track of history in terms of what he wanted to do. But either way, he wanted to do one of those projects. And Harry Saltzman said, no, 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 dude, dude, that's not what you want to do. You want to break into the mainstream and then make those movies. You should really do this third Harry Palmer story, um, Billion Dollar Brain. And, you know, Ken Russell had a relationship with Michael Caine because they'd worked together in the past. And um, Michael Caine was very much in favor of bringing Ken Russell on board. And so Ken Russell signed on. But there was a funny anecdote where they said Ken Russell was the world's worst businessman because he received no guarantee from Harry Seltzman whatsoever that he would get to do the movies he wanted to do in, in you know, um, basically in trade for doing Billion Dollar Brain. They classic Hollywood, one for them, one for me. Um, he forgot to sign off on actually getting the one for me project. <laughs> right. How did that work out for him? Uh, his career was fine, but, um, you know, short term, I'm sure it was a little frustrating. Mm. Um, they brought on the writer, John McGrath, who was mostly known for TV at that point. He was a writer, director of a TV project called Diary of a Young Man. Um, and him and Russell had uh, worked together on an episode of the BBC series Six um, from 1964 as writers. And McGrath had also worked with Kane on a 1961 TV special called The Compartment. 
And so it was three guys who had, you know, common ground in terms of their experiences and relationships. And it seems like basically what happened was Russell and McGrath read the novel, didn't understand it, and decided to just focus on what appealed to them. And that's what they have been quoted as saying. I don't know that that's true, because I have read that they've said that the novel is fairly close to the film. Is that true, Shane? Yeah, absolutely. It's In fact, I think it's one of the closest to the actual novel than some of the others. So I'm wondering if it's more like they got the notes but not the music, where they understood all the plotting, but Ken Russell, if you've seen his other movies, he's not a narrative-fixated guy. Like, he doesn't really care about narratives. Um, I know that, Scott, you haven't seen um, any of Ken Russell's other work, but he's somewhat akin a little bit to, like, a David Lynch, and there's a director I know you're very familiar with, who is much more driven by mood and feel and kind of out there imagery than he is by like a tight narrative. Well, for the first time ever, I can actually say I have seen one of the films that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I have seen Tommy. Oh, there you go. Okay. So does that strike you as a guy who would be making very um, literary spy adaptations? No, no, I didn't put two and two together that he made this film, but now you've connected the two. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, So the movie came out at the tail end of 1967. As always, the box office gets a little muddy trying to dig that up for that era. Um, It seems like the movie did about 3.8 million domestic in North America, um, which equals about $28.4 million now. So not a big performer. Do you have a budget for it at all? No, I don't have a budget. Um, What I did find was there was one dude I found who quoted it as $3 million. And I believe that Funeral in Berlin was like in the 1.5, 1.8 kind of kind of category. I can believe that this was around 3 million. When you look at what they're trying to achieve in the finale of this movie, that actually rings fairly true to me. So I I can buy that. So again, I feel like they kind of broke even with this one. Which is not what they're going for. And they're doing that two times in a row. It sort of makes sense that this was maybe the last uh, Harry Palmer film in the cinema. Well, it also must have been a bit of a head scratcher for Harry Saltzman, right? Because he's put out his third James Bond film and it's, um, you know, Goldfinger. (laughs) And then the third Harry Palmer movie is Billion Dollar Brain. And it's kind of like, wait, these two things are not operating along parallel tracks here. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I'm working my way through a a book that Michael Caine wrote two years ago called Blowing a Bloody Doors Off. And... (laughs) He says in that, there's two things of interest. First of all, he felt Billion Dollar Brain was very underrated as a movie, uh, but there was some regret about his recommending of Ken Russell. But the other thing that was interesting to me is Alfie was a movie that apparently did very well stateside. Mm -hmm. And when he was here touring with Alfie, he looked up at a cinema and they were showing the Ipcris file. And that was sometime after the movie had come out, but they were obviously oh, he's doing well in Alfie, we'll put the Impress file out in the US. So I wonder if that artificially inflated the numbers for Impress file. Probably. That's the whole thing with that era is movies would come back all the time. And so it's tough to really um, put a lot of faith in numbers you find for their grosses because it's kind of like, well, wait, how did it do actually in 1967 slash 68? That's the real question mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, the top three for that year, you had The Graduate, The Jungle Book, the Disney film, and Bonnie and Clyde, three major, major movies. Um, Billion Dollar Brain, nowhere near that top 10 at all. Um, In fact, here's a list of these spy films that beat it. Uh, You Only Live Twice, um, Harry Seltzman's other Bond film, Um, Casino Royale, the Bond spoof, In Like Flint, um, the second of the Flint movies starring James Coburn. The Ambushers, which is one of the Dean Martin, Matt Helm films. The President's Analyst, also starring James Coburn, more of a serious uh, spy film. And then The Naked Runner, starring Frank Sinatra, another spy film. And uh, Billion Dollar Brain was below all of them. So the movie domestically had a lot of problems. It was criticized for being very anti-American, which I can kind of buy. I read that before I watched the movie. And then watching the movie, I was like... Yeah, this is a little a little weird, a little weird for sure. I don't know if did you guys agree with this criticism. I uh, to be honest, I I I didn't see it that way. And maybe being well, actually, I'm dual citizen now. Um, but looking, I I just saw it as was this Len Dayton having a pop at the McCarthy era and what that could have become. 
Right. Um, rather than it being anti-American. But I can imagine how an American might look at that and think, well, they're poking fun at us here, especially the scenes in Texas. I mean, that was not short of the Ku Klux Klan, really, was it? Right. <laughs> Um, so I, I can understand the criticism, but I didn't really see that myself. You can kind of understand more so from the point of view of like 1967 America, where there is like a red scare going on, why they would be more upset by this movie. Nowadays, I think Americans would be more likely to laugh at it. And if you think about the Soviets in this, they come across as the good guys. Which was also a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the bit I could see them actually having an issue with at the time is the fact that the, you've got the friendly Colonel Stock just, oh, hey, hey, English, how are we doing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're meant to be rooting for him. It's, it's strange. Yeah. How popular was Carl Malden in the States? Very popular. Um, you know, he's in uh, On the Waterfront. He was a very beloved actor. At mm-hmm. this point in time, when you're getting to the tail end of the 60s, I don't know if he's like as up there in lights as he was in the fifties, but he even still has um, West side story coming just a couple years later, a year later or something like that. So he was a pretty well-known guy for sure. Because if you, if you look at the cast list, if I think of myself as American, I look at that cast list, obviously Michael Caine, Carl Malden, but then after that, that's it, right? Where's the star part? I mean, yes, Donald Sutherland has a very small part. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but not known, um, not a major part. So, you know, I sometimes wonder if the cast, if Americans have a problem, if there's unknowns in the cast. Oh, I, mean, I think so. The Naked Runner, right? I mean, uh, that's a great book, but I've been told it's, it's a really poor film adaptation, but it has Frank Sinatra, doesn't it? Yeah, and this is the era of the star system, where it is all about selling movie stars, which is something that young people won't get anymore, where we sell properties more so. Um, back in this era, people went to the movies because of the movie star, for sure. Yeah. A um, couple little postscripts on this box office performance. After this, uh, Michael Caine was like, okay, I think I'm going to get out of this Harry Palmer business. He was under contract for five films, but Harry Seltzman let him go. Obviously, the box office performance made that a lot easier. Um, he was just worried about being um, basically typecasted in this role and wanted to move on. So they let him go. Um, and Ken Russell apologized for this film for the rest of his career. He would often bring it up at Q and A's and in articles where they would write about him. It was not hard to find quotes of him talking about this movie and just what a disappointment it was and what a poor experience it was just in terms of, I guess, a learning experience for him for what he wanted to do with his career. And just lastly, um, Francois uh, Dorliac, um, I may be pronouncing that wrong and I apologize, but, um, she passed away shortly after this film um, or even just shortly after shooting, I should say, in a car accident. Um, so that was a real uh, tragedy. So there's some questions as to whether she was dubbed in the movie. That's never been really confirmed because of uncertainty about whether she would have been able to even loop dialogue afterwards. So I'm not, I couldn't find any hard data on that, but it seems like it is a question that gets kicked around quite a bit. It, it is interesting that... You say that it's the era of people going to the cinema to see stars, but I thought Michael Caine at this point would have put butts in seats. Alfie, I think, would have really done a lot. So I think he, uh, he would have been a draw. I don't know if, like, was Michael Caine the draw that, like, some of the other stars we talked about were? I don't really know if he was as much in America. I mean, he's not Cary Grant at that point. Sure. He's not He's not got that sort of sway. Hmm. He's also like falling into this period where you're introducing a lot of the new Hollywood actors, you know, people like Warren Beatty, for example. Um, I'm just wondering if he fit into that kind of mold, which is really drawing people in as well. And other than Zulu, he'd mainly played Cockney characters. Yeah. And I'm wondering in 67 or at that era, was that an accent that was tricky for Americans to understand? Mm, that's a good question as well, yeah. I mean, I struggle and I live here. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, wraps up basically what I've got on um, Billion Dollar Brain. So I think we can move on. Okay. Well, Shane, you're the guest. Obviously, you've come back to this film. You wasn't a big fan when you saw it originally. Has your revisit changed your opinion? I'm afraid it hasn't. I still very much see this as a movie of two halves. Um, what I will say is that... I've been pretty negative on this. Uh, a couple of positives really are, I love the the selection of Helsinki as a location. And in fact, Finland was used for most of the European scenes. So the scenes in 
Latvia were filmed in in Finland because having been to Finland, it's a very quirky place. Right. So, you know, it's not like a standard looking European city. So I think Helsinki was a good choice for a lot of the filming. I liked the camera shots. I think it was beautifully shot how you, how you see Finland. I mean, it looked pretty desolate in parts, but nonetheless, beautifully shot. Um, so that, that they were elements of the movie that I liked. I also liked, I did laugh at some of the humor, particularly the scene. And I think every Brit will laugh at this when he's in the sauna with, you know, the hot woman and uh, Carl Walden. And they ask, invite him if he wants, a, I think, a brandy or a vodka. He says, oh, a cup of tea be good. <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly agree with them after being out in the snow for that long. I could, I could, I could actually imagine me saying that. I, I, I thought you were actually going to say about the sauna scene and just being awkward, because we, we do that too. <laughs> well, I lived in Sweden for three years, so I'm, I mean, you know, I'm away from that being awkward now. No, you kidding. Um, no, you're right. I mean, just completely awkward. Um, and actually, I, I remember when I was 17, I was in Strasbourg at a conference and uh, being very naive, I went into the sauna of this conference and there were actually three naked Scandinavian women in there and I did not know where to look. So I, I understand Mr. Kane in, in this regard. I remember when I was in Australia, I was at this hostel and my friend and I were like, where are the showers? And they're like, oh, the communal showers? They're just right around the corner. And we were <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It was it was awkward. It is. I, I remember that the, they they were a combination of Swedes and Finns, and they were teasing me once to why I was wearing a towel. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I needed a cup of tea at that stage, probably with some bromide in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I would have just been the guy that stood by the door for a minute and just sort of like, uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I should say we did not use the showers. So we were like, you know what, we're here 24 hours. We could just move on after that. <laughs> But the, the other thing in terms of the humor is when, you know, poor, poor Harry gets dumped out of the car from Colonel Ross and he has to walk all the way back to town mm -hmm. and then get with a snow plow. This is so anti-James Bond. I love it. You know, that wouldn't happen to James Bond. Uh, well, I suppose that actually brings me on to what I was going to say about the film, because this is me experiencing it for the first time. And that is one of my biggest takeaways is about the James Bond connection, because I've seen the Harry Palmer series go from anti-Bond to a little bit of Bond to as much Bond as we can fit into this film. And that's how I took Billion Dollar Brain. Yeah. Um, and I just think like it worked best, maybe not for me personally, but as a film when they tried to stay away from this stuff. But, you know, this film has its own credit Bond sequence. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's interesting that a lot of people I speak to who like this movie are huge James Bond fans. And that's weird because like, I am a huge James Bond fan and I didn't like The Ipcris File. And one of the reasons was it wasn't very Bond-like. But I feel like mm -hmm. this went too far and basically just ruined what they were doing. Yeah, like I say, I think the first half was, was fine. Uh, and then when you got to you know the, the big villain's lair in Texas, the big villain's speech... Uh, the computers everywhere, the henchmen all in the uniforms. That's that's 007 for me. Mm -hmm. That that was a dub, more of a 007 feeling than the previous two movies. Right. Uh, for me, this was a movie I found intensely frustrating. And that the first half, I was kind of on board. It felt a little weird. Like, I really enjoyed the storytelling of the first two Harry Palmer films where they were, you know, you had to keep track. You had to be an active watcher. But it felt like the movie was rewarding you throughout for being an active watcher. Whereas I felt like this one was often confounding. Mm. <laughs> and I would sit there and be like, okay, I need to backtrack. How did we get here? How The scene is not lining up. And I just wonder how much of this is Ken Russell not being someone who's that interested in keeping track of kind of the bullet points of a spy plot. Which, you know, in a movie that's a very literary spy film, you kind of hope for. And so I began to get frustrated. And I was missing sort of the the wit of the Harry Palmer, you know, moments that you would get yeah. so much throughout the first two. But I thought, okay, well, this is fine. Like, I'm enjoying seeing Carl Malden. I'm enjoying seeing some of these new characters. Hopefully this is going somewhere. And I mean, honestly, like, I will always be, in, you know, overjoyed at a movie where, like, people are responding to a 1960s computer because that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. But, but in that second half was where I just began to get annoyed. Because I yeah. felt like, on one hand, it was paying off the things that 
were really confusing, a lot of them, in the first half. But it also was going Bondy, for sure. And we should say the art direction was by Sid Kane, who worked in the art departments on From Russia With Love, um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service later, as well as um, Live and Let Die later. So he definitely had some Bond, you know, credentials when he did this movie. But it also felt very Dr. Strangelove in that it was very over the top and strange. And I feel like a lot of it was intended to be satire and obviously satirizing the Red Scare in America during the Cold War. But it also just felt like, I mean, there's no subtlety. There's no wit. You know, uh, there was a famous saying, I think Roger Ebert used to always quote it. I don't remember if he's the one that came up with it. But he said, you know, satire should be a scalpel versus, you know, like farce can be like a hammer or something, whatever he used for the whatever tool he <laughs> tied to like farce or slapstick, that sort of thing. But he said basically a, a, a scalpel is what you needed for satire. And this movie is like a bludgeoning instrument with its satire. Like it doesn't feel that sharp. But that said, like I did enjoy the direction of the movie. I think Ken Russell makes great looking movies. I just mm. found this movie so frustrating, though, in a way I did not, ex- you know, anticipate going into the third Harry Palmer film. Let me ask you this. If this was a standalone movie, it was a one-off Harry Palmer movie, there's no Ipcris file, there's no funeral in Berlin, would you have enjoyed this movie more? I think so, yes. I think it, I would have been more willing to meet it on the terms that it was coming at, which was kind of strange. Um, This one, I'd been so indoctrinated into kind of the feeling of a Harry Palmer story and sort of the the joys of that franchise and the payoffs you expect in that franchise that this movie just doesn't want to give you. So it's like, do I criticize this movie for doing its own thing and Ken Russell kind of just being a little bit of a strange dude um, versus the expectations I bring to it? I don't know. Like there's so many carried over elements like, you know, Colonel Stock and Ross and all these various elements that were obviously introduced in the past films. So I don't feel it's unfair to have the expectation that you're going to get a similar kind of feel. And I think James Bond had set a template, you know, Harry Mm -hmm. Seltzman had done this before. So it is a very strange movie. And I think if it had been an original property, it wouldn't have grated on me as much. I may not have liked it very much, but I would have at least appreciated that it was doing something interesting and weird. Yeah, as I say, I I still, you know, I find it jarring because if we go to those, the opening scenes of, Harry Palmer's office, you know, which is sleazy, grubby, bit run down, women's underwear under his bed, you know, when Colonel Ross is in there, you know, you that's Harry Palmer, mm. right? And then you you go from that him working as a as a PI to this whole big super spy thing. Um I just you thought they started it off really well and then it just like I say the second half is where I kind of tuned out because it deviated from that so much. I'm surprised there wasn't more hesitance on the part of Harry. Because if you look at where Funeral in Berlin leave, uh, sorry, leaves off, he mm. doesn't want to be part of this spy game, more or less. He's so you know, disheartened in what Colonel Ross was doing. And you can kind of see how he ended up being a private investigator. And I, I'm sure that's... Is that in the book, Shane? I, oh gosh, as long as it's read it. I, I'm going to say I'm not sure. I need to check that. Okay. Right. Um, but that feels like a progression of a character, whereas within the, the space of 15 minutes, he's already in Helsinki. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's you know, back in the game. And, and it felt like in the previous two, he had very strong reasons for not wanting to be a spy. You know, he was on, like, parole, basically, um, working for the agency. Like, I bought that this character had this kind of working class spy life where he fe- was, like, kind of working for the man and not enjoying it. Versus this movie where it doesn't, really even pay lip service to that whole struggle within the character. You have him saying he doesn't want to go back. Why doesn't he want to go back? Like, has anything changed? And then he does go back and we get little quips with Ross, you know, at the end. And I'm like, okay, like, does this character now just feel at home working for MI5 or, or what? I have a feeling in the book, there was certainly more coercion. And Len Dayton is very good at creating his characters in terms of, their their motives so i'm wondering again if this was something i'll need to read reread the book but i'm wondering if it's something that just wasn't adapted well from the novel yeah it felt like a lot of this movie 
I was watching Ken Russell bring style to it, which I appreciated. Mm. Like, there's a lot mm. of weird wall art in this movie, and Ken Russell always will, you know, he will always take every chance he can to film wall art that's weird and interesting. So, like, there's a lot of red in this movie. Wait, when is naked women being weird art? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just the naked women art. There's oh, a lot okay. of art. Every time there's art in a room, he's like, I got to show this. <laughs> there's a lot of red in this movie. I appreciated that, that this throughout this movie, there's all these vivid red images. Ken Russell is a stylist. And I think um, Michael Caine even said, like, he's an emotional filmmaker and he is a madman. Like, he makes very strange, abstract movies. And he was the wrong guy to make this movie. I think a lot of what's interesting about this movie is the stuff that Ken Russell's bringing to it in a weird way. He's he's both making this sequel very frustrating, but he's also making the movie kind of more interesting than it has any right to be. Mm -hmm. I still feel like I would rather have had the team behind Funeral in Berlin just tackling this script. Well, you'd have better continuity when you're bringing back returning characters, for sure. One of the one of the scenes I really liked, and it's not even related to the movie or the book. I just thought it was really cool, and probably health and safety wouldn't let you get away with it today. Do you see that kid's playground ride? Oh, the oh. the death trap in this film. <laughs> where they were, it was like a Ferris wheel where they were supposed little Finnish kids were just spinning around. I was like, wow, that looks cool. You had the um the elevators in Funeral in Berlin, and uh, this playground death trap here. <laughs> They never get away with it today, right? Those kids flying through the air. But still, that was well, a, I mean, those, oh. things, those things in Berlin still exist, so maybe these things still exist. Maybe. I didn't see any when I spent time in Finland. Um, but yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll ask around and see if they're still there. If not, maybe I should put them in the back garden. Look, look fun to me. I, I'd go on it. <laughs> I am so with you, though, Shane, that the Helsinki setting of this movie does add a lot. Like, you can't argue that this movie doesn't look great. And the way they tie in the atmosphere of Helsinki is beautiful. Yes. And the whole finale on the ice, which was a tribute to uh, Sergei uh, Eisenstein's um, 1938 film, Alexander Nevsky, is audacious. It's not something I'd ever really seen. And I was really wowed at just the sight of all these tanker trucks crashing through ice. Like it's beautiful work from Ken Russell and his yeah. whole effects department. That's the sort of stuff that like, it feels like it's in the wrong franchise for a Harry Palmer, you know, world. But those are the moments where I at least sat up and appreciated what I was watching on a visual level. And, you know, just kind of digging that Ken Russell, when he, when he has a vision, he can achieve it. Yeah, and remarkable that that was all polystyrene filmed in a giant tank, apparently, using real vehicles. Yeah, it's absolutely nuts. Like, it looks like a million bucks for sure, or a billion bucks. <laughs> well, and again, that, that's what lends it to be rather Bondian. Okay, the whole thing didn't blow up and everything as it does at the end of a 007 movie, but it's still that big finale set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think by the point the tankers were diving into the water, I was completely lost. Not lost as in I wasn't understanding the plot, but just lost as in, what is this? Yeah. I, I'd seen like a, a Nazi speech, basically. And I just think, uh, what? Yeah, you have that big, it's it's weird, like the movie Patton came out after this movie. It almost feels like a Patton speech, but he's got the, I guess, some sort of American Eagle logo, but it very much, um, <laughs> it's very <laughs> similar to the Nazi Eagle symbol. Um. Very, very similar. <laughs> um and it's kind of this weird, yeah, like fascism moment. And I guess, you know, a lot of it feels like it's satirizing America's response to, um, you know, the communist scare could tip into something a lot scarier. And I mean, obviously, with the McCarthy hearings going on in America, that was the case. So like, I can appreciate that the movie wants to tackle these kind of themes. It's just that it's done in a way that's so over the top, it feels like it belongs in a different movie. Well, the personnel carriers being disguised as the company's oil tanker trucks. Yeah. Again, again, I keep saying it, and I know that some of my listeners are going to be furious at me for this, but this is what it makes it more of a Bond movie to me or a, you know, su super spy 60s movie, fantasy land was, I mean, they were cool. I liked how they did it. But like you're saying, it just didn't, it was too, too jarring for me. It felt too big. I was going to say, you've got all the guys in their little jumpsuits that basically happens in most of the Bond films or the henchmen in the colored suits. And then you've got like Ed Begley's character drowning in that little bubble at the end, screaming at the camera. Like, yeah, it's so bizarre. 
It feels too big to me for Harry Palmer. Like when you look at what he's dealing with, the missions he's on in the first two, I buy those missions and I believe that this is the guy they would send on these missions. In this movie, I'm looking at it going like, where's Superman? Yeah. <laughs> we need Superman. <laughs> Well, yeah, because like the biggest, well, I don't know, the, the biggest action scene in Ipcus File is the the tumble on the stairs, and then and then it's followed up with I don't know the most tense action scene in Funeral in Berlin, which is an exchange of a coffin over Checkpoint Charlie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then this is what uh, you know, a thousand troopers being drowned in an ice lake. Well, I'm curious from you two, how did you feel? Maybe starting with Shane about the whole concept of this supercomputer running things. Like, did it feel I don't know. Does it feel creaky now or is it something that still holds up? No, completely dated. I mean, there's more power in my iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> so, but again, you, you've got to put yourself back in the sixties where this was a big deal. Um, so, you know, I, I don't hate on the film for that. And I think at the time of writing, I mean, um, Len Dayton was the first author to publish a book via a word processor. So he was very into his technology. Oh, so I imagine when he was writing that in the 60s that it would have been, you know, bang up to date. So I, I don't hate on it for that. It's just, you know, when it was published. What about you, Scott? I just saw it and I just thought Landrew the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I, you know what? I'm on the same page as you, Scott, in that I guess there was, you know, a real 1960s anxiety about computers and artificial intelligence. Um, you know, Scott and I both um, are very familiar with the original Star Trek series. and there's a lot of episodes where computers have taken over a planet or have caused right. some sort of horror. And so I was completely along for the ride, even though it feels so absurd now, you know, we're, we're still grappling with the ramifications of AI in the future. And to see them doing it in 1960s is always kind of fun where you're, pun you know, um, putting in um, punch, punch cards, card. that sort yeah. of stuff. And you're like hearing that classic computer voice. It's like, I enjoy that. Like, I honestly would have loved a Harry Palmer story where he is going up against the 60s computer. Just the one that didn't tip into such a broad, almost cartoonish, you know, uh, payoff. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to see the, uh, the the verbal chess match between the billion dollar brain and, and Harry Palmer. I really thought we were going to get that. Yeah. Like, I thought this movie, given the trajectory of the first two, we would see more of Harry Palmer having to match wits with a computer. And just like that dry wit versus, you know, the, the, the complete logic of Donald Sutherland. <laughs> but then also talking about the wit, you know, I, I've referenced in our conversations there how this film, the second half is Bondian. But then when you look at that final scene in Texas where um, General Midwinter is going to kill Harry Palmer and unlike Bond, he doesn't have a gadget. He doesn't have a Bond girl stood behind the villain who's going to, you know, knock him on the head. He has to rely on his street smarts and his wits to get the general to look at the camera to see where Leo Newbegin is. I thank God for him that at that moment, Carl Marlden was shredding paper and staring at the camera <laughs> nervously. Uh, how convenient. <laughs> yes. That moment made me laugh, but I appreciated it as well. You know, you're saying about the wits of Harry Palmer. Yeah. That's a great moment. Like in a movie that kind of turns into a mess in the latter half, um, I genuinely felt like we still had some good character stuff, you know, however sparse it was coming from Harry Palmer. I just wish it had, it felt like he was very much, you know, the key cog in the wheel of those first two stories we saw, whereas this one, it often felt like he kind of got shuttled off to the side just because yeah. everything was so big. I, I mean, I was fortunate enough to watch this last weekend on Blu-ray. I got the Blu-ray version, and it's beautiful. They've done a really good job on it. But, and it's much better than the first time I saw it on DVD. But I do wonder what I would have thought had I seen this on the big screen or how it looks on the big screen. Would I have enjoyed it more? That can change my opinion on the film. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe this is just better suited for the big screen. I would love, I would love, wish my little cinema would do that. <laughs> yeah. Have, not see it. But Billion dollar brain cool. sellout. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that there's, yeah, a lot of revivals, especially over here in uh, North America for Harry Palmer films. But I mean, it's one that if it were playing, I might be tempted. Um, and uh, Scott, you had to buy this on Blu-ray, didn't you? I actually had to buy the DVD and it was an awful, awful transfer. It was really hard to watch. Oh. So I, I also understand, Shane, how you might not have liked it the first time you saw it. 
Yeah. So I'm kind of keen to see what the Blu-ray looks like, although I don't think I want to buy it. <laughs> wait, wait, Scott, you're not going to buy it? <laughs> hey, I bought the Ipcris file on Blu-ray. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I am a, a glutton for punishment. Well, it's interesting. Everyone, I haven't seen this. Apparently, it's on the VHS version that there is a 30-second deleted scene. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where they play the Beatles' A Hard Day's Night blares out on the soundtrack. And a lot of the fans really lament that not being included on, on the DVDs. I heard about this uh, being edited out, and I wondered where it fell in the film. Do either of you know? Yeah, it says 32 seconds were cut from the movie as there was a scene in which a Beatles song was playing in the background in Finland. Was it the scene where Harry Palmer goes um, into Latvia and meets up with that basically ragtag crew that are the, um, um, you know, the secret, um, you know, spy agency or whatever that he's trying to track down? It's kind of all a, a ruse, but... There's a reference to the Beatles in that scene, mm -hmm. but the Beatles aren't heard, and I was wondering if that's where it was placed. I don't know. I can find out for you, and you can add it to your show notes, etc. I'm mm -hmm. sure some of our scholars will tell you exactly when that was, because apparently it is on the VHS version. Right. Because the, okay. the guy runs up and goes, hey, English, want to buy a Beatles record? And you're like, yeah. is, that, is that what you yeah. ask all English people? No one's ever offered me to buy a Beatles record. <laughs> well, it was the 60s. What did, I mean, that leads on to a good topic. What did you think of the soundtrack? I actually really dug it. Um, I wasn't as impressed with the score for um, uh, Funeral in Berlin, but I really mm. dug the score for Ipcris File. And this one by uh, Richard Rodney Bennett, it's very distinct. It feels, you know, you can totally feel some of this score as being similar to something you would hear in one of Ken Russell's crazier movies. Like it definitely gets a little more strange and outlandish and weird. But I really dug how much atmosphere it had. Uh, for me, uh, I, I I put my hands up when we spoke about a funeral in Berlin with Duncan that I didn't pay much of attention to the Ipcris Files score, although I have heard and I've been told since it's one of the, the, the better scores of the 60s. And right. then he was very disappointed in Funeral in Berlin. And I paid attention with that film. And this film, I felt, was better than Funeral in Berlin. What do you think, Shane? I, I like the music in the first two, particularly at Chris File. This one I thought was okay, but uh, you, you might be familiar with this, Scott. There was a 70s cop show called The Sweeney mm -hmm. with John Orr and Dennis Waterman, and they made a second movie called Sweeney 2, which I'm a big fan of. And it's weird. The theme music they use for that is very, very similar to the main music they use in this piece. So it confused me. That sort of sweeping mm -hmm. piano thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think if I remember what that sounds like now. Yeah. Um, Sweeney 2 is an obscure movie, so I'm not saying you should go watch it. But if ever you do, you'd be like, oh, yeah, billion dollar brain. There you go. So it wasn't nicked or anything, but yeah, it was. It, well, it, it's like you watching Star Trek and hearing some music. That's, that's out of Star Wars. You'd be a little, it would confuse you a little bit. Yeah, I could, I could see that. One of those geek things. Hey, hey, we're, we're all about that. I mean, I, I just. Um, <laughs> I didn't find the score of this film as obtrusive as uh, Funeral in Berlin was. That, that, that bit in the beginning where they like got the umpa music, as Duncan called it. And I yeah. just remember that standing out to me a lot when I heard it. Yeah. Whereas this was just kind of there. But this movie also gets so much weirder. So like the score kind of complements that. It's in many ways almost like forecasting the weirdness to come in the first half where... I felt like I was tuning into more of a, you know, uh, not a standard, but just sort of the expected Harry Palmer story. And the music's kind of strange. I'm like, well, that's weird. But then the movie is almost forecasting that you're going to go into some very bizarro, <laughs> almost like <laughs> surrealistic uh, territory. Yeah, I think it was very fitting. Yeah. So I dug it. Yeah. Okay, well, let's have a quick run through of our key actors in the film. Obviously, we have Michael Caine reprising his role for the third time of as Harry Palmer. We have somewhat spoken about him, but how do you think he did coming back to the role? Um, honestly, in parts, it felt like he was phoning it in, in comparison with the first two. Um, I felt that maybe that was because just how how wacky the adaptation was and. As we said earlier on, he wasn't always central to the movie. So he definitely seemed not as on his game as the other two. But I don't know if that's just he was having off days or was it the script? 
Yeah, I missed sort of the cynical distance he had in the first two where he was always involved in the plot, but he would give off the impression he didn't care. Mm -hmm. Um, And you always would have those snide remarks and the kind of the withering responses to things that would happen. And it felt like he was a very distinct character. You know, you can say that the Sean Connery bond that's created in the 60s is very specific. It felt like Harry Palmer was very specific in his own way. In this movie, I felt like a lot of that just got kind of lost because a lot of it was him just kind of, you know, being passed around, going on these missions he didn't seem to understand, just more of a passenger in the movie. Yeah. And when you did get little quips and whatever, they felt almost more mainstream. You have that bit, you know, where there's like the virus laden eggs that are being passed around throughout this movie. And at the end, he brings them back to um, to uh, Ross, cracks open and there's, you know, chicks and he makes the, yeah. the joke about, well, I'll take 200 pounds. You know, it felt yeah. like the type of quip you would see in almost a James Bond movie versus the other ones, which the humor was very, it was just very like, um, almost like um, bitter, which I dug. And this movie just kind of lost that. So Michael Caine's not bad. He's a, you know, he's a great actor, but it's just not, he doesn't feel as engaged and I kind of don't blame him. Mm. I, I found it bizarre because I, I listened to a, uh, a audio interview of him I found on YouTube from the set of this film. And mm-hmm. he was, I mean, it might have just been, you know, actor PR spin stuff, but he seemed to be really enthused about playing the character again. I, you could take it either way, like I say, but um, he, he was talking about like how he envisions the role, how he likes to imprint, how he is in his acting career on Harry Palmer at the time and stuff. So I thought oh, this is really fascinating. And then didn't see any of that in the film. I think Kane's a pro, right? He's a professional actor. He gives 100% in terms of committing to the role. But, you know, it's like a chef. A chef can only be as good as the ingredients he's given. I mean, if you've ever seen the uh, disaster movie The Swarm with Michael Caine where he battles bees, that man will commit to any scene. Yeah. So, like, I feel like he was probably committing to the, what was going on here. It's just like the movie was almost not that interested in him. He, you know, he kind of just got lost in the, in the, in the chaos. I kind of feel like that's the case. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But then he's, he is almost always there. So I don't know how that film has managed to lose him. But it feels like the events of the first two are filtered through his perception of them versus mm. this movie where he just feels like more of an observer. Okay, well, I mean, in terms of other returning characters, we have uh, Oscar Ho- Homolka. English! <laughs> English! <laughs> Brilliant. Steals the show. Yeah. Uh, I, I love seeing him come back. I, I had heard he was returning, and as soon as I saw his cheerful face, I, uh, I I brightened up. Yeah. He's a lot of fun. You know, it's always fun when you watch, you know, a James Bond film, and you get those recurring characters like a Felix Leiter or something or Monty Penny. And I love that Harry Palmer has his supporting cast that pops up too. And this is a very colorful character, which I appreciate. He's someone that does stick in your memory. And I like that... He's, you know, a Russian character that we actually find fun and and he's somewhat trustworthy. He may not put all his motives on Front Street, but he does tend to work on the same side as Harry Palmer, which I dug. I don't think you're ever going to hear a comparison between Money Penny and Colonel Stock ever made again. <laughs> Mark that down, folks. That's a that's a true amazing comparison there. Can you imagine him sitting at the desk as Harry Palmer comes in and, you know, throws his hat on the hat stand and then like just try and chat him up on the desk? <laughs> I want to see it. Let's get that Ipcris file, you know, part four going. <laughs> and what an entrance, right? Well, he comes in as the, the room service guy, right? I mean, what an entrance in this. Oh, yeah. Oscar Walker, not Money Penny. Ah. I was like, where was she? Was I that out of it in this film? <laughs> we might have been. We might have been just like that. When Colonel Top makes his appearance. Uh, dressed up in the hotel uniform. I like that. It, it's nice to see someone in a high-ranking military position, which this is probably nothing near reality, which is maybe why we didn't like this film. But to actually just see the whole board and he recognizes that Harry Palmer is a good guy, even though they're not technically yeah. working on the same side. Yes. He didn't, he didn't need to look out for Harry. Well, it's also, it adds a little bit of humanity to a very de- dehumanizing job. You know, these spies... Uh, they basically work for their governments and they've got to do very dark things. And I like that these two relate to each other as humans, even if they, you know, are on sides that occasionally don't get along great. Well, we've got our James Bond and we've got our money penny. That means we need our M 
And that's where Colonel, Colonel Ross steps in. I'm a big Colonel Ross fan at this point. I mean, anything that brings continuity to the series, I dig. And at first, I really struggled with this character because he just didn't grab me as much as, you know, um, his counterpart in the Ipcris file, um, uh, Dobby. That was a character I loved, but I've really grown to dig Ross. He's a character that I like how he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, Again, you talk about recurring characters. I was glad he was in there and it wasn't someone else because it definitely needed that continuity. And he's just, uh, you can't swear on your show, but he's fatherless, right? (laughs) He's a right B. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 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 Um, It was nice to see. um, The reason why I like Colonel Ross is he is the guy that is always exasperated with Harry Palmer. Yeah. And he's constantly just like, oh, and that's how I feel when I watch these films. So it's just great to see. Well, you think of how many American cop movies in the years that would come after this featured, you know, the captain or the sergeant or whatever that's always reading the riot act um, and taking the badges away. Like Ross kind of has that down, you know, in the 60s. And actually, it's a common thread in, in much of spy literature where the boss is exasperated with his agent. Mm. You know, you even have it with M. Yes, there is you know, a bond between M and James Bond. But, you know, you look at that Man with the Golden Gun and some of the more uh, Roger Moore movies, you know, M's totally exasperated with him, even though he's oh, yeah. been an agent. And that that runs throughout Spy Literature. And particularly in a lot of Len Dayton books, there is that almost classist, um, you know, the the agent is working class and the, uh, the boss of the department has got the old school tie going. So you see a lot of that go through Spy Literature. This one didn't have as much of the commentary I felt like on class as the previous two did, though, which I kind of missed as well. Well, I guess it was tough with it being in Helsinki and then dealing with Texans who apparently have no class. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe that's a good cue for us to talk about Ed Begley as General Midwinter, the villain of this movie, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it depends on your interpretation, I suppose. But, uh, like, I, I think he was a a very bombastic character in a film that that likes its bombastic stuff. Completely far-fetched, completely over the top as a villain and just totally, you know, no no credibility whatsoever, right? I mean, you're just laughing at him. He's got like a, a, a what is it, a four-minute scene where he's just shouting at Harry about his plans? <laughs> exactly. And other, another uh, common, uh, something else it has in common with the Bond movies, right? Oh, yeah. And I would like to quote him here. I think maybe his greatest line in the movie. Strong, 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 strong. (laughs) Actual quote, actual quote there from Midwinter. Um, He reminded me, I made a note when I was watching his performance, this bizarro Ed Begley performance. He reminded me of the Texas businessman on The Simpsons. The one who's like, I reckon I'm from Texas and I reckon I do business. Like there's no subtlety whatsoever to Midwinter. Um... He is what he is. I can't say that it was a performance that, I don't know, like I think I would have enjoyed this performance more if it had been just confined to like one scene versus stretched over a quite, you know, reasonable amount of film in that latter half. That's where I began to get more annoyed by the performance. Yeah. Agreed. By the time he's like sitting in that, uh, the, the the tanker, barking orders at people, well, shoot him, son. You know, and you just think, what is this guy? Yeah. I was going to say, I've never met a man so passionate about uh, Latvia. <laughs> well, I mean, I really dug, too, that he throws these hoedowns where everyone's wearing cowboy hats and, like, stomping yeah. around. <laughs> it's just, just laughable, isn't it? Ludicrous. It's insane. I, 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 this, is, this might be a controversial thing, and, and, and we, we can cut it if it's, if it's controversial, but... Um, I was not. I wouldn't be surprised if the camera turned around slightly and there was a nice table at the back with some white hoods. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, that's what they were winking at. Definitely. Yeah. Unfortunate as it as the situation as it is, but that that whole thing. But then, but the problem is with that. If you're trying to deal with a, quite a a topic of that. I don't know, gravity, um, you really should pay it some attention, whereas they just made it laughable. Yeah. Yeah. The whole character was a joke. Maybe that works, but um, he made his entire mission a joke, and you didn't buy him, and you knew he was going to be beaten. Yeah. Really couldn't take it seriously. 
I mean, to be fair, he did give me my favourite scene of the film, uh, which is that him drowning in that little, you know, perspex bubble. That, that, that image. Mm. <laughs> I, I, by that point, uh, as I said, I'd lost the plot. So him screaming in that perspex thing is just how my brain felt. Here's the question: Is this a good performance by him? Yeah. It's a very tough to answer question, I feel like. This could be a horrible performance for all I can tell. I haven't seen him in anything else, so I don't I don't know what else he's been in, so it's hard to kind of compare. But yeah. again, as we said earlier on, you know, the chef can only work with the ingredients he's given, and if you're given a script like that, how do you play that other than one-dimensional? I can just imagine Ken Russell saying to him, project this to the back of the room. Yeah. Just go. Pedal, pedal down and go, because... Every scene, he, he's not being, you know, reflective or anything like that. He's just shouting at you, um, which probably works for some people. But uh, for me, it was just laughable. Yeah. And I laughed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so in terms of other characters, I laughed at Carl Malden as Leo Newbegin, which, by the way, I have to point out, there's two names in this film that feel very, uh, and Shane, I'm going to steal your term, but Bondian. New Begin and Midwinter. Do they just not feel like Bond characters? I mean, Midwinter also reminded me of Whitaker from The Living Daylights. So yeah. that's kind of Bondian. But Leo Newbegin, I don't know that he really reminds me anyone of anyone other than maybe Oromov. He has a real sweaty sweat factor going on in this movie. Especially when you first meet him. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's weird because this is a strange one. In the book, I believe he's called Harvey Newbegin. Yeah. So why did they change it from Harvey to Leo? It's kind of like that classic um, Incredible Hulk when they translated that to a TV show and changed his name from Bruce to David. You're like, uh, okay, why? <laughs> yeah, you wonder about that, don't you? Yeah, it's very strange. Maybe in the phone book there was someone named um, Harvey Newbegin and they didn't want to annoy him. I, I have no idea. That one guy's like, how dare you? They do do that, though, sometimes in old movies. They'll change names because there was, like, some famous person or some person of note who had a similar name. So I don't know. Well, talking about the Bondian connections, you also had Vladik Shebal. Yeah. yeah. Who, uh, yeah. In, uh, from from Russia with Love on Casino Royale. That was uh, – who always plays, you know, interesting parts. I thought he was quite <laughs> – just a very rude Latvian, wasn't he? Isn't he an amazing character actor, though? You just drop yeah. that guy in one scene. All you have to do is look at him, and he just gives off so much. Yeah. He's an actor who could, almost could only exist in the 60s. <laughs> like, I don't know that I would even buy him in a movie in 1990s, for example. Agreed. I didn't get why he was so angry that they brought Harry along. But to be fair, he was hilarious. So I was on board. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the only other character we have to talk about is Anya. Um, she's supposed to be the sort of love interest slash you know double agent of the film did you did you buy the love story oh 100 percent, scott i was so on board with this romance <laughs> i thought it was the most realistic thing i'd ever seen where harry, harry palmer met her and within like five seconds he's kissing her i'm like oh yeah yeah i buy this this, this is a romance for the ages i'm willing to buy everything that happens after this no this was absurd <laughs> Yeah, Every man that I meet, I often take directly on a boat and then promise to show them my secret garden. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, those, fins, those fins are a bit crazy, you know? We'll say that. Mm. If, if you spend winters in Finland, it can do funny things to you. Yeah, like, I think this character God, might have worked... by Finns and Texans after they listen to this, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to be the one going into hiding. Welcome aboard. <laughs> I think I would be more forgiving of this Anya character who has a whole basic instinct twist to her where she stabs men in the back with like <laughs> ice. I don't know if it was an ice pick. It sure looked like one. But, um, you know, I'd be more forgiving of this character if I didn't have Samantha Steele in Funeral in Berlin, mm. who I feel like brought so much more to the concept of, you know, the female agent sort of love interest in that film versus this one that just feels like, you know, I talked, I can't remember what movie it was we were talking about, Scott, but I said that I get really fed up in movies where I have so many double crosses that, or triple crosses or quadruple crosses that it begins to get frustrating. You know, I think I cited um, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End in that yeah. uh, review, but that was kind of the case with Anya here, where 
she has so many moments of, you know, pulling crosses on people that I just, by the end was like, I don't even know. I, I don't know who this character is at all. Yeah. What does she call it when she like in broken English, a double cross, was it like a cross cross or something? Uh, something like that. Yeah. 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 She, she crossed cross too much, but I think as soon as she started butchering that cello, Oh, <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> that was dreadful. I had a similar response to her cello playing as I did to um, Ed Begley's performance where I'm like, is this good? Because I, I don't think it is. Yeah. Where am I? What is this? Uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if she was supposed to be playing it correctly. That's the bit I wasn't sure if it was a joke, like a wink at the camera. Like, was yeah. she just jolly from her time in the sauna? Yeah. I have no idea. There was also a very strange moment with her. I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but there's a scene where she tries to kill Harry Palmer and then there's like a struggle. And this prolonged struggle is like a montage made up of upskirt shots. It's very weird. (laughs) That that scene made me feel awkward. Yeah. I I wasn't sure what they were trying to get at. I know it was like a a a steady cam, a handy cam, like they're just sort of whatever it is like i don't know what the word for it i'm sure cam can figure it out but um where they're just sort of tracking them across the room and it's all over the place but i didn't get what was going on i didn't know why they had to do it that way it just felt like it felt a bit icky well you know i've you watch some of ken russell's more surrealistic films and he does weird flights of fancy like this where you're it's very much like a mood thing it's it's setting like a strange tone you know it's trying to capture you more emotionally than intellectually, but I don't know what emotionally this is trying to communicate to me (laughs) other than discomfort in a way that I'm not sure I should experience because I don't think Harry Palmer is wrong to be basically trying to, you know, subdue someone who's tried to stab him in the spine. Yeah. No, I think he's got every right to defend himself. Yeah. He's just throwing her out the building. It's not like he's like beating the living daylights out of her. No, not at all. Yeah, it's it's a very strange sequence that really jumped out to And me. yet you feel like he is beating the living daylights out of her. Yeah. It's weird how yeah. they've managed that. Yeah, well, the direction is basically implying a level of violence that the movie's not showing. And it, it's very hard to be critical because the, the poor actress died four months uh, before the release of the movie, right? Yeah. yeah. And so we could even say we maybe don't even have a good register on the performance if there was indeed dubbing going on, right? Like, we don't really know. I tell you who steals the show is, is um, we haven't spoken about him, but Stanley Kane, superb performance in this. Um, Michael's brother. He was the oh. poor man who brought him. The- <laughs> Michael's had a word, give me brother a job. Any, any chance you can give him a bit of work? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yes, Michael Caine's brother. Um, amazing performance, as well as um, um, Susan George pops up in this movie. Yes, eating, I guess, an orange or something. I'm not exactly sure what that was. She was eating on the train, and then Harry Palmer starts reading a newspaper. That's a early. Um, it's not a cameo. This was just an early role for Susan George. She would go on to appear in. Um, I guess her probably most notable film is the um, Sam Peckinpah Straw Dogs. But yes. this is one of her early appearances. I, yeah. I I didn't react to what you just said, Shane. But so Stanley Kane was in this film. Yes. What was he? I I just looked it up on IMDb while you were talking about it. What? He was the postman who comes in into the the private eyes office. Oh my god! And that's his brother. <laughs> this is why you invite me on, right? Obscure facts. Yeah, that just brightens my my opinion of this film a little more, though. It's like that's just a cute thing. It's just oh, let me get my brother in. Sure, he needs to work. Yeah. I just looked on his IMDb, and he was like in the Italian job. I didn't even know that. Wow. There you go, Cam. You're the film expert. Obviously, you knew that. Um, I wasn't as familiar with Stanley Kane as you guys are. Oh, I'm not familiar with him. I just googled him. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I I did see that. Yeah, I had that in my notes that he did pop in as a cameo there. Yeah, for sure. But. Uh, Shane beat me to it. There you go. Yeah, one thing that jumped out at me, if we're just sort of picking up on little bits of the film we want to talk about, did, did anyone catch that really odd shot at the end of the hockey game? Um, at the end of the hockey game, or the the switch from like the the cut from the um, uh, I guess thwarted assassination, or you know, the assassination that Carl Malden's going to perform, and then doesn't cutting to the hockey 
arena? No, because you get is that what you're no, because he or? doesn't take the shot, and then then it kind of makes a noise, and it goes to Harry walking up to the hockey arena, and then he's talking to Anya in the crowd, and she makes some sort of like one liner about I I can't remember what she says, and then it has this like scream. And then it just cuts to the goalkeeper, or if that's what they're called in hockey, just staring at the screen. And I just think, like, what? <laughs> oh, I I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. And I think in that moment, it was weird. But there was a few weird cuts in this movie that, you know, I, I just kind of admired that Ken Russell was doing something kind of strange. But I was more just um, fascinated by how strange the hockey goalie mask looked. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably just the, the, the not modern version. But uh, the the retro goalie, yeah. And my biggest disappointment, we we talked about the various formats this came out on. So I got the Blu-ray, I watched the movie. I thought, oh, let me see what the extras are all about. It'll be handy for the podcast. Zero extras. Yeah, I heard that's the case for Funeral in Berlin as well. Ah, oh, the Empress one's full of them. Yeah, yeah. And it would have been nice to have heard commentary. Um, because it may have answered some of these questions we have. So I, I, I was very underwhelmed having no bonus content. And I, I, was, I wouldn't recommend a DVD transfer either to anyone who's looking to buy it after our review. I don't know why you would after this. But um, yeah, the DVD is not very good. So try and pick up the Blu-ray transfer if you can, at least. People are going to buy it to see Stanley Kane. Come on. <laughs> yeah, they'll turn off after five minutes of the film. <laughs> and it's a movie that you can... You know, you can totally justify having the extras. It's not just some phoned in yeah. sequel that they just went with, you know, cut rate talent on. This is a Ken Russell film and one of his earliest, and he is a cult filmmaker with a big audience. I don't see why they aren't putting some money into just shooting some documentaries talking about the movie, placing it within its context of his career, but also the Harry Palmer tr- series. I, I don't know. If they're willing to spend like a ton of money, on doing special features on some like very lackluster um, horror movie being put out by Scream Factory or whatever. Mm. Like, why not? Why is there not something on the Kino Lober, um, you know, billion dollar brain? Yeah, yeah, disappointing. And you wondering if Michael Caine would do commentary. I mean, the, the book I'm, I'm reading of his right now, he, he narrates the whole thing. So he's in his mid 80s. He's not flat out with work, you know, I mean, Roger Moore, for instance, I'm sorry to repeat, um, to talk about the best bond again. But mm-hmm. you know, he did a lot of audio commentaries and all the, the bond blu rays, I believe it was. Um, mm-hmm. But then I think, well, hang on, this was filmed in what 67. Like, I don't even remember what I did a year ago at work. <laughs> so you totally. wonder what some of the actors memories would actually be like. Well, and it's something I've learned over time, mostly attending Star Trek conventions, really. And that, like, working actors don't sit and watch their work the way we do. <laughs> true. It's very true. Yeah. And so they're kind of like, oh, yeah, that, that one? You know, you'll hear some weird anecdote about how when they shot that episode, you know, they were in, like, I don't know, just – it could be anything. They sold their house or there's some sort of real-life incident they were dealing with at the time of shooting that moment or shooting that, that episode or movie that kind of overshadows what we take away from the movie. <laughs> it's some real-world event that we're like, huh? Uh, okay, sure, I guess. But then there'll be that one nugget they'll share, and you go, oh, "I didn't realize that." Or I didn't. Yeah. I, I love all that stuff, to be honest with you. And I would love to hear Michael Caine's commentary on some of these, but not to be, I guess. I, I disagree mm-hmm. entirely, Cam. All I do is listen to Spy Hard. <laughs> yeah, I am the expert yeah. of Spy Hard. I've I've listened to them all hundreds of times. <laughs> You're your own biggest fan. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it feels like we're sort of coming to the conclusion. So is there any final thoughts uh, you guys have on the film? Shane, we'll throw it to you first. No, um, it's it's one I would watch again with several large glasses of scotch mm. late on a Saturday night. You know, I, maybe I wouldn't turn it over if it was on TV, but it's nowhere near. It doesn't have the pedigree of Funeral in Berlin or of Chris File for me. And apparently the next two that came out in the 80s are atrocious. I've never watched them. They are on my list to pick up, uh, but apparently just, just dreadful. So shame, really. Good character, and uh, I just think it's a missed opportunity. Well, don't worry. We're, uh, we're tackling them. <laughs> oh, I'll look forward to that. <laughs> I have no idea what we've brought ourselves into, but uh, yeah, the, the two 90s TV movies... Yeah, we are. We will be revisiting Harry Palmer again. Oh, what about you, Cam? Any final thoughts or tidbits? 
this is a movie that reminds me, because um, I obviously don't have a huge background with Harry Palmer, but I do have a big background with Batman movies. And growing up, I absolutely loved, you know, the first two Tim Burton Batmans. And I remember watching Batman Forever and just being like, what the hell was that after those first two? I feel like Billion Dollar Brain is kind of the Batman Forever. It's better than Batman Forever, to be fair. I, I don't want to get people too rankled up. But more the sense that just tonally it feels like a whole other beast. And when you try to watch it in connection to those first two, it's just kind of frustrating. And so, like, it's a movie that I can totally recommend to people in the sense that if you've watched the first two, just to kind of see the the bizarro you know realms that the sequels go and the franchise goes but it's also a movie that uh it's just i don't know you know it's just something that exists that i'm glad i watched i felt a certain amount of you know i felt like it was one i could walk away from and actually have a bit of reward from not like say men in black 2 but it just kind of frustrated me a lot and um i just want to say as well Eat Kellogg's Corn Flakes. They're good for you. They bring, they bring <laughs> great vitamins to you. What, what I will say, though, is that I think the three of us are uh, pretty much in agreement about the movie. But what I will say is if, if our listeners, if I can share this on your show, if you Google 00 section billion dollar brain, there's a gentleman called Matthew Bradford who you absolutely need to have on an episode of Spy Hards. He is a film expert. And he loves this movie, and he's written a very glowing review of this movie. And I would urge Spy Hard listeners to go listen to this and then go check out Matthew Bradford's review as well, just to get it, the pro side of this. For sure. And there's a lot of actually critical reappraisals of this movie, some of them that will tackle it from the point of view of being somewhat of a satire on the 60s spy movement. There's a lot of good writing out there on this movie, so definitely check it out. It's not like we're going to tackle on this podcast sequels that – maybe even the next two Harry Palmer sequels that are just like, you know, there's nothing really to say about them maybe, but this movie, there's a lot to say, especially within the context of Ken Russell's work as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I just think for me, Shane kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of, of pointing out that this film may well have been better if it had nothing to do with two films that came before it. And I can, now I, I've had that picture in my head. I can definitely see it that way. But for me, ultimately, I, I, I'm not going to give you my whole opinion because I'll save that for the knock list. But um, it was just a letdown. Yeah. Simple as. I feel like it had a, a, a good cast. Uh, it's got some good names behind it. And it should have been better than it was, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I would love to have heard more about the Harry Palmer Detective Agency. I don't know about you guys. Definitely. Looking at those photographs that... Uh... Colonel Ross was uncovering. Looked like he had a jolly old time. I I I often go and look around in my divorce drawer. <laughs> <sighs> well, okay. Question time: Does Billion Dollar Brain make the knock list? Shane. No. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay 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 um well cam you're the one that's going to decide whether my vote means anything so uh go for it yeah it's a no from me um you know funeral in berlin was one didn't quite make it in the list but i contemplated funeral in berlin a lot more than i contemplated this one this one's just it's a mess kind of a fascinating mess but a mess nonetheless you're a poet and you didn't know it <laughs> i know right um, yeah, this film, it just feels like they squandered in the opportunity they had to make a good follow-up to Funeral in Berlin. I really enjoy Funeral in Berlin. I didn't really like Ipcris File, but somehow this film has managed to be worse than the Ipcris File in my book. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I would rather go back and watch Ipcris File again. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least it was doing something. <laughs> True. Um, so again, as I suppose you could figure out, it's a no from me too. And therefore, Billion Dollar Brain is not making the knock list. And with that revelation, the dossier on Billion Dollar Brain is complete and filed as classified. Uh, Cam, before we talk about what we're doing next week, Shane, I want to thank you so much for joining us this week to talk about Billion Dollar Brain. Uh, we spoke about it earlier on, but where can people hear more from you? So either go to spybury.com or just tap in spybury into your podcast app of choice and uh, you will find our podcast. Awesome. 
I would absolutely recommend checking out Spyberry, guys. If you like Spy Hard, you'll love Spyberry. I was listening to their, um, their James Bond book club earlier on today, and they have a, a really cool way of going about tackling the James Bond books. I won't spoil it, but check them out. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that out as well because I've been reading the novels myself. So I can uh, get up to speed and it'll keep me uh, motivated to read them all. So Cam, what's up for next week? We are going to the year 2016 to talk about the Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart comedy, Central Intelligence. I have no memory about this film apart from the poster uh, where I think it points out the height difference between the two of them. Really? Do they go yeah. to that? Do they go to that well for comedy? I didn't know that they did that with Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> it's it's a new thing they're trying out. Yeah, yeah. We'll see oh. if it works. <laughs> so your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Central Intelligence and join us next week. Don't forget, you can check out the knock list at letterbox.com slash spyhards, where you can find all the films we've tackled so far that have made the list and have not made the list. And you can, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, good luck among the shadows.